human population growth. You can see from this curve that what we've got here is a J-shaped curve. So J-shaped curves we learned before are exponential growth rate. And we have been increasing exponentially since about 1650. And we're not growing exponentially anymore, but we're still growing pretty fast. And um, just like any other species, we can't continue to grow exponentially. And so at some point, oops, that's a little messed up. At some point, um, we're gonna reach some kind of a carrying capacity and we don't know where that is just yet. These are some um, human population milestones, which I think are really interesting to look at. So in 1804, we were at um, about a, a billion people. And then more than 100 years later at 2 billion, that's a pretty fast rate of growth. And then we've got only uh, 30 years and we're at 3 billion and then another um, 14 years and we're at 4 billion. So the rate of increase is uh, pretty, pretty crazy when you're on an exponential um, growth curve. I remember learning about this, uh, might've been my freshman year in high school and we were around 4.6 and now we're up at 7.6, uh, I guess. And um, yeah, so here's population growth in my lifetime. So we're still um, growing very, very quickly, but our rate of growth has actually slowed. And um, that started during the 1960s um, due to the birth control pill. This is an important um, table to, or graph to understand. This is called the demographic transition. And it's showing the difference between um, pre-industrialized societies and um, industrialized societies. So this is birth rate. And so this is showing a high birth rate and also a high death rate. And so if you have a high birth rate and a high death rate, you will have a pretty flat uh, total population. So this line is the total population. So you can get zero growth when you have a high birth rate and a high death rate. Or if you look at this end of it, um, you have a pretty low birth rate and then this line is the death rate, a pretty low death rate. And so if you have a low birth rate and a low death rate, you also have a, a pretty flat um, population growth. So this is showing, um, this graph is showing the difference between um, pre-industrialized societies. These are mainly developing countries that um, are switching from, well, they're going to be more in this area. So what happens is that um, at some point um, the society gets um, developed enough to decrease death rate, but birth rates are still high. So when that's happening, population is increasing. And then at some point you, the birth rate kind of catches up in that um, people start having fewer babies. And so they end up having both a low death rate and a low birth rate. Um, maybe when um, women are more educated and um, people end up deciding um, to have fewer babies because the babies are more likely to live. Um, it tends to bring birth rates and death rates together. And so you end up having a, a pretty flat population um, growth again. And so this one just says that the the current population growth, most of the current population growth is concentrated in developing countries because they're at this stage of the demographic transition. Whereas um, societies that have been industrialized for quite a while are here with a, a fairly flat um, population growth. The age structure is a really important thing to understand to be able to look at these different uh, graphs and understand what that means for the population growth. So if we look at this first one, it's um, showing the ages of people. So zero to four in these cohorts, five to nine, 10 to 14, and so on. And so you, if you see a really, really big population among young people, well, these people are all gonna grow up and have babies, or at least a lot of them are. So this is a very rapidly growing population. Compare that to this one. You have a lot, you know, a fair number of young people, but it's pretty much the same as the middle-aged people, and um, maybe a little bit bigger than the older people. And so this population is growing, but it's not growing very quickly. So this is what the U.S. looks like. This population has actually a smaller group of young people than it does people in the middle years, and um, about the same as the older people. So this is showing no growth, or sometimes even um, decreased growth for this last type of population. 
Okay, global human carrying capacity. Um, we actually don't know what it is. So at this point, we are in this J-shaped curve, and at some point, we're going to reach carrying capacity. And so we don't know if that carrying capacity is at 10 billion or 15 billion or some other number. Um, but the hope is that we, whoops, that we reach this carrying capacity and stay there, um, as opposed to exceeding the carrying capacity, degrading our environment, and ending up at some lower carrying capacity. Okay, carbon footprint is um, another thing kind of related to this. And so what this means is um, how much carbon each person is producing and sending into the environment. So carbon um, is found in organic molecules, like the molecules that are in you. And so here you are, and you have um, organic carbon in you. And so that's carbon that's stuck in you for right now, and it's not out in the air making the world warmer. When you do cellular respiration, which we'll talk about later, um, you're producing CO2. If you chop down something else that's organic like wood, and here's the wood, and you light it on fire, whether it's in your um, wood-burning stove or whatever, um, that is combustion. And like cellular respiration, whoops, like cellular respiration, it's also producing CO2. Or these plants maybe might die and get buried for a couple of million years and become fossil fuels like carbon or oil. Um, you might put them in your car and uh, drive away. And here you are in your car. And the gas that you're um, burning also is combustion, and that's adding more CO2 to the environment. So that's your carbon footprint. Um, and it's the amount of carbon dioxide and other carbon compounds emitted due to the consumption of fossil fuels by a particular person. So your cellular respiration, we don't really worry about because photosynthesis takes in CO2 um, out of the environment and grows plants. And so here's uh, a really ugly plant. Let's make it a palm tree or something. That's a world's ugliest palm tree. Maybe it's a flower. There we go. It's a really ugly flower too, sorry. Okay, so um, and we would of course eat that. Here's the carbon cycle. Um, what we worry about really are the fossil fuels that are burnt um, because those are fossil fuels. Th those are, that's when carbon is you know stuck in some molecule like um, in coal or natural gas or oil. And it's not in the in the air. Once we burn it and it gets into the air, that increases the carbon dioxide levels beyond what normal plants and animals would be doing to the environment. And so that's what your carbon footprint is. And um, the bigger your carbon footprint is, that means the more fossil fuels you're using, um, and you know the more we're damaging our environment, maybe increasing the um, greenhouse effect and uh, possibly heating up the world beyond repair. Okay, so if you look at um, countries and their carbon footprint, um, gigajoules, these are, um, this is a, a measure of how much energy is used. And so you can see some parts of the world use uh, a whole lot of energy per um, person, and some parts of the world um, use a lot less energy per person. And so as countries develop, they end up wanting things like cars and air conditioners. And so you end up moving from, um, you know, maybe more moderate, carbon footprint to a, a higher carbon footprint.